This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the hosting provider I use for devchat.tv. I also use it for my applications that manage the RSS feeds, scheduling, and sponsorships involved in delivering these shows. DigitalOcean is easy to use, has data centers all over the world, and provides terrific services including server hosting and object storage for delivering your web applications and assets quickly and easily. I use DigitalOcean because I love their interface. I get SSD storage for my servers and their support replies quickly. So go check them out at DigitalOcean.com. Hey everybody and welcome to another My JavaScript Story. This week we're talking to Zach Kesson. Zach, do you want to say hi? Hi! Now you're you're over in Israel, so uh, it's it's in the evening there, and it's in the morning here, which is always fun. Um, oh yeah! And we had you on episode fifty-seven of JavaScript Jabber and episode one sixty-nine. the The first one was about functional programming, and the second one was about property-based testing with QuickCheck. Yep, I still do both of those things, at least occasionally. Yeah, actually, I- the last. Last month, I've been doing basically sales, and I don't think I've written a line of code in three weeks. <laughs> I know how that goes. <laughs> I definitely know how that goes. I, you know, I, I go through that cycle with the sponsorships on these shows. But anyway, do you want to just remind people who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Zach Kesson. I've been a web developer in one form or another for something like 23 years now, maybe closer to 25. Uh, you kids get off my lawn. Yeah, I really, I, I really am older than dirt. <laughs> That's what I tell my kids. Uh, I tell my grandchildren that. Uh-huh. I, I have grandchildren. Yeah, two of them. I wrote the books "Programming HTML Five Applications" and "Building Web Applications" with Erlang for O'Reilly. They're both really out of date, so they're at this point more interesting for historical values. And I these days I play with Watson a lot, which is really cool. Uh, I also play with Erlang a lot, and I on the front end I do a lot of um, Elm code. Nice. So, That's so very part. much in that uh, functional programming camp. Yeah, very much so. I've decided that I want to use technologies that ensure that I will never be able to find a job. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm kidding about that, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. But yeah, that's sort of what I do. And Elm is awesome. I love Elm. So that's right. probably what we should talk about. Probably. Now, this this is mostly about just capturing your story, how you got into code, you know, what you've done with JavaScript and things like that. I know we're also going to dig into uh, Erlang, though, and Elm and things like that. So it should be kind of an interesting and, uh, I guess, well-rounded conversation about a lot of these topics. Well, it will only be well-rounded if we talk about Lisp. There we go. Uh, I've written me some Lisp, well, scheme, but anyway. Me too. Well, so anyway, the first question that I usually ask is, how did you get into programming? So my mother was actually writing Lisp in 1969 in college. Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid and I wanted a computer and my mom said, I was seven at the time, if I could come up with half the money, she'd pay for the rest. And so I called all my relatives and begged for money. See previous comment. I was seven. (laughs) <laughs> and we bought a Radio Shack color computer, 16 kilobytes, that's kilobytes with a K, of RAM, and it had BASIC on it. My mom taught me to program in BASIC. Actually, before that, before we even had a computer, she taught me to program by basically doing logo, where instead of having a computer, she would just do it with her hand with a pen. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, this, this was... This was like 1979 or 80. This would have been 1980 or 81, Uh I guess, after my sister was born. And so then I did Pascal in high school. Took the AP computer science exam, which in those days was Pascal. Uh, I'm dating myself now. Yeah. Went went off to university to study computer science. Very quickly switched from computer science to physics because I liked it more. And then I did what all good physics majors do when they get out of university, which is uh, program computers. Makes um, sense. And I remember the first time I saw the web, which was like sophomore year of college, and I was on, kind of didn't quite know what to do with it. It was like, okay, it's a thing. I'm not sure what this is. And then I remember my housemate and I just sitting in our kitchen, and we'd figured out how to make a form on a, we- a web page, but we couldn't figure out how to make it submit. Uh-huh. Uh, we hadn't figured out CGI scripts yet. Um, there was no JavaScript in that day, in those days. 
And yeah, and it went from there. I did Perl back in the day. My first web app was written in Perl 4 with MSQL, not MySQL, MSQL. MySQL wasn't a thing yet. You know, I've just been developing ever since. And, you know, I got on the Ajax bandwagon pretty much on the beginning in 90, in 2005. Uh -huh. um, I actually wrote an article for an O'Reilly magazine about you could use SOAP from JavaScript at that point. It's before XML HTTP request came out. Yeah, that's what I was doing. And I, at some point I was doing PHP for a living and I hated it since PHP is kind of fractally bad. <laughs> There's a good article called PHP is fractally bad or something like that. Gotcha. Um, I went looking for a new language. I checked out Haskell and Scala. I don't think Clojure was around yet or it was really just beginning around. And then I found Erlang and I'm like, oh, this solves all the problems I wanted to solve. It's got a syntax kind of funny looking, but it's simple. And it, you know, does real reliable and high concurrency and all those fun things. And, you know, it's really nice to use. So I got, went with Erlang and I called my editor at O'Reilly um, and I said, hey, Simon, uh, I can't figure out how to build a web app with this. What do you say we write a book about it? And he went, cool, do it. So that's how I ended up writing a book on Erlang. And then a couple of years ago, I was doing some front end stuff with JavaScript and it was just being painful and I couldn't find all the corner cases and all the bugs. And I read about this Elm thing, and I met Evan at a um, conference, a code mesh in London. This would be 2015. And he sat down with me a day, for a day, and we showed me how to use Elm version mm. 014, maybe, 015. And I've been using it ever since, and it's been getting better ever since. Cool. I like the fact that I, you know, all right, you can crash Elm at runtime, but it's, but it's hard. There are two or three ways to do it. I'm waiting for somebody listening to go, challenge accepted. Oh, I can tell you how to do it. I did a video on my YouTube channel. I mean, obviously, you can do a stack overflow run out of memory, uh, but even that's hard. Uh, if you do an integer division by zero, it'll crash. Mm -hmm. Although a floating point division by zero will not. Uh, that's oh, a bug. It'll be, it, the, the, it's, it'll be fixed in the next version. Or mm -hmm. if you instantiate a regular expression data type, on an invalid regex, that'll crash your code. Gotcha. Those are the two the two of the ways. I think there are a couple others, but mm -hmm. those are both considered bugs in Elm. And um, there are a couple others, but they're all getting fixed in the next version. So I like the fact that bugs that in JavaScript might have taken me all day to debug because, you know, I misspelled a variable wrong or something or a field name. In Elm, it's just, oh, compiler error. Oh, that's the problem right there. 30 seconds and I'm done. It's like, it just saves me a metric buttload of work. I've heard that from a few people that use it. Um, one thing that I, I would like to kind of dive into a little bit is, you know, you mentioned uh, learning to code as a, as a kid. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of folks think that that's kind of what you need in order to be a programmer, right? You you have to have kind of come up in it. And I know plenty of people who haven't. I'm, I'm a little curious. Um, I mean, what was it? As a, as a young person or as a kid that you found in programming that made you want to do it for the rest of your life? You know, I'm not sure I even remember. I mean, clearly, I don't think you need to have been programming since you were 11. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I think there's some advantage to having not done so. There's less bad habits you have to unlearn. Yeah. I think I just wanted to figure out how to make it do things. But I don't even remember what my motivation was as a kid. I swear I wanted to. You could ask my mother, I guess. She'd know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like if you're later in life and you're thinking about jumping into this programming thing, don't be afraid. And also I would say if you ever get to the point in a project as a new programmer where you're on the verge of tears because nothing is working right, that doesn't mean you're a bad programmer. It just means you're having a crappy day. We've all been there. You know, it's okay. I was going to say, I just, I just talked to Kyle Simpson for this same show right before I talked to you. And for him, it, it, he makes it sound almost normal, right? We kind of accidentally get it right most of the time. I, I don't know. Since, since I've discovered, I started using Elm, I've discovered the number of tiers I put into the average project has gone way down. Right. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't occasionally come up with weird stuff that you have to deal with, but it's much less. Mm -hmm. uh, the compiler, a lot of the bugs that you'd find at runtime in, in JavaScript, the compiler finds in Elm for you. 
and gives you an error message that tells you exactly how to fix the problem. Right. So it's like, oh, I mean, you misspelled this. I think you meant this. Oh, okay. So I also find that I write a lot fewer tests in Elm code than in JavaScript code. Mm -hmm. Because simply a huge amount of the validation I would do in unit testing or with a quick check property in JavaScript, the type system does for me. And so, you know, why write, you know, I actually have a video on my YouTube channel. Uh, I'll send you a link to it called the function that can't be tested. And it shows how to in JavaScript or not in JavaScript, in Elm. Sorry. It's been a long day <laughs> that it's like there are certain functions that, and they're fairly basic ones like the function to take the first element out of a tuple uh -huh. for which, you know, it, on one hand, it's fairly trivial to write a unit test for it. It's not that you can't. It's just that it is assuming you don't use debug.crash, which basically is something you'd only use in testing. Right. It is impossible to write a function, a test for that function that would fail while the code still compiles. So gotcha. any fault that could happen in that function will be discovered by the compiler and you, any test therefore would be, I mean, you could write it, but it would be just completely redundant. Mm. And I think that's a really cool idea. And as you get better at using types and you start saying, instead of, you know, just saying this is type string, this is type, you know, create a type email address, for example, you sort of reduce the number of bugs you can have even further because, oh, look, you know, you've created this function. It takes a, a use an email address type and does something with it. You know, well, now you can't pass a string in that's something else, you know. Uh huh. You know, you do the same thing in Erlang with tuples and atoms where, you know, you have a, t a value that is, you know, I don't know, a username or a user ID or whatever. And fundamentally, a user ID is probably just a string, but, you know, or something else could be just an integer, but you don't want to use it as just an integer because, you know, lots of things are integers and mm -hmm. this lets you, uh, provide some barriers around that. Yeah. Um, I've been programming long enough to know that if there's a stupid mistake that can be made, I will make it. <laughs> so I like tools that prevent me from doing that. Yeah. Makes um, sense. The, uh, uh, I, I was going to say, the, go ahead. The past tense of, I know what I'm doing is what the bleep was I thinking? Yeah. That is so true in programming. <laughs> and life in general. Yeah. So I, I am wondering, um, you know, you've, you've done uh, all kinds of stuff with, with Erlang and Elm and, you you actually did an Erlang podcast for a while. Yeah, I did. I'm curious, what of all of these things that you've done or worked on are you most proud of? My YouTube channel is kind of fun. I haven't done any new videos in a while, sort of readjusting my business. Mm -hmm. Building web applications with Erlang, the book was definitely, I think, good. I spent a lot of time just recently just mentoring people a little bit, and I think that's very useful. It's a combination of stuff, though. I don't think there's one specific item. I like the fact that I've also, and I think you've done this too, I've made my method of contribution to the community not be, here's another quick, ch here's another open source package to do something, but, you know, here's audio and video content that may explain things. Right. And I think that has value too. I've also been doing some, so I think that's good. And I think we need, you know, one of the things we need to work on as programmers is, you know, bringing more people into our communities it is far too easy to inadvertently do something that may exclude large numbers of people. You know, the percentage of developers who are women, who are minorities of one of one form or another, are generally pretty low. Uh, I'm not as in tune to the U.S. development scene as as you are, but mm -hmm. you know, it's definitely the case. And you've certainly heard, we've certainly heard stories of you know sexual harassment at lots of companies. So I think we really need to. I mean, I thought I've done much with this, but you know, I think it's something that the community needs to spend more time on, really focusing on that. That it's not just about the code. The code is the easy part. It's about the people. Mm -hmm. You know, the code ain't worth a bucket of war spit if the people aren't around to use it. Yep. Yeah, we definitely see that. 
There's a lot to talk about there, but uh, that's a topic for a whole nother. Yeah, it is. I, I was gonna say you could do a podcast, not to like an episode, but like a whole podcast series on just that. And yep. And, and if we're gonna do that, we probably shouldn't have two white guys be the ones talking about it. Well, or not just two white guys. E- either way, I, I think you know, as long as you go out of your way to a gather all the information that you can and then represent it well. Yeah. But I think I think there is room for more thoughtful conversation than we tend to have. On the yes. Topic. I think there's and, room for it. I think there's need for it. So, and yeah, what was Erlang Factory San Francisco and is now being called Code Beam San Francisco, which is coming up, I think, next month. Uh, Miriam Penna is going to be one of the keynote speakers. I've known Miriam for a couple of years, and she's an amazing coder and speaker. So I won't be there in person because it's a bit too far, but I'm mm-hmm. looking forward to seeing the video on YouTube. Absolutely. Um, so, so what what are you doing now then? You know, you mentioned that you've been doing sales for the last couple of weeks. So where where are you at? Are you doing training or coding? I'm or? actually building um, AI chatbots around Watson, which are aimed to increase sales for fashion and cosmetics companies. Okay, that's pretty specific. I'm taking a lot of advice off the freelancer show. <laughs> so Ruben, and Philip and Jonathan and Kai, thanks, thanks guys. You know, I picked a niche. I figure a lot of programmers aren't going to head for. I have an adult daughter who's a makeup artist, and uh-huh. I looked at what I was wearing to work one day and decided I needed to upgrade my wardrobe to something heavily. Oh, you all on the podcast can't see this, but I'm actually wearing a shirt and tie right now, which in Israeli terms might as well be like white tie, white tie top hat and tails because Israelis don't wear ties, but I wear one to the office every day, and I'm pretty sure most of my office mates think I'm a little weird for it. But I tell them you should dress for the job you want, not the job you have. And I don't have the abs to pull off Batman. There you go. I like that. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So uh, these chatbots, are they for clients then? Or are they for... Yeah, yeah, yeah. For clients. um, You know, I'm pitching them to various companies. And um, one of the things that I realized is a friend of mine commented on LinkedIn that he hates going shopping for clothes and actually recently had paid a female friend to go with him to the mall to help him buy clothes because he was so bad at it. And I'm like, huh, I wonder if we could solve this with AI. Uh You know, how many people do you know who hate shopping for clothes? Me? Uh, Yeah, me too. I hate shopping for clothes. You know, but we all wear clothes. At least I hope we all do. And we all, I guess, would like to look decent. Yeah. You know, so uh, it seems like there's a market there. So that's what I'm working on. Nice. Uh, I was trying to do Elm training. There's just people weren't into it. So I changed my mind. It's amazing what you can do when you uh, pick a different niche. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, yeah, the last part of this episode is picks. Do you have some picks? Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, And you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter dev chat in the how did you hear about us section. So the first isn't a pick so much as a piece of advice. But I guess I'll call this a pick. If you read a book professionally, like about programming or sales or whatever, and it and you find it's a benefit, it is totally worth it to drop an an email or a tweet to the author to say so. Uh-huh. Uh, I've been on both sides of that email, and I'll tell you, it totally will make as an author. And as authors I've written, it'll totally make their de- your day. Right. When you know you, because it takes a lot of work to write a book, 
And if you get an email from some random stranger going, hey, I read your book and I just had this great result because of it, it'll totally make you their day. I mean, it makes it all worthwhile. So that's one. I'm reading a cool book right now called How to Get a Meeting with with Anyone. Nice. By um, Stu Hinkle or Hinka. I mispronounced his name. Sorry about that. The other book I just read was by Eric Klein, and it was called uh, 1187 BC, The Year the World Fell Apart. And basically at the end of, at that point, which is right around uh, when the, the exodus from Egypt happened and the fall of Troy, all of the major civilizations of the ancient world collapsed sort of all at once. And uh-huh. this was an analysis of sort of trying to not figure out from what we know the hows and whys. And it has nothing to do with anything in the modern world, but it's kind of interesting. And I'd just like to point out one thing, mm-hmm. which has nothing to do, again, nothing to do with anything. Julius Caesar is closer in time to the moon landing than he is to the building of the pyramids. By about a thousand years. <laughs> I guess we don't really think about it. We just kind of <laughs> demarcate sometime. Yeah, more it's than all three the or 400 years ago. It was. Yeah, it's all, it's all back there somewhere, you know. Yeah. It's ancient, but it turns out antiquity is really long. <laughs> so, yeah. That's all. That's all I got. Awesome. Well, I'm going to jump in here with a couple of picks. Um, in the last episode, I kind of promised that I was going to talk about some of my quote unquote medical equipment, which is essentially cooking stuff. Um, so I'm diabetic and I've been trying to follow the keto diet. Um, I've, I've kind of blown it a couple of times and then gotten back on the train. But anyway, one of the things that uh, I've been trying to do is just cook my own meals and, uh, you know, stick to the program a little bit better that way. And so I've been buying this this stuff to cook with. And one of the machines that I bought that I'm really digging right now is a smoker. So it's a master-built smoker. Um, I don't know if you can get those in Israel. And I've been cooking pork in it. So and, and, um, Not so much for uh, – you can get it here, but I, I, I think you can get smokers here because I think my wife's cousin has one. Uh-huh. And if you want to buy pork in Israel, just look for a store with a, Russian, a sign in Russian. Gotcha. Anyway, so, yeah, so I've been making um, ribs, which I, I really, really enjoy. And it's, it's awesome. I love just being able to put food in it and then forget about it. The, the, other, the other thing, and so I've got, I've got a pork shoulder in the, the slow cooker right now. So if you have a slow cooker or crock pot, uh, that's another <laughs> deal that I'm... I'm uh, oh, those, we got two of those. They're great. Yeah, they're wonderful. I have, so I have one that's kind of a large one, and that's what the pork shoulder's in. I have another one that actually is three smaller ones that are all in one appliance. Oh, neat. And um, my wife just got me an Instant Pot, which does the pressure cooking and things like that, which I haven't really had a chance to play with yet. So I'll probably pick in the future once I've had a chance to cook a few things in it. But I'm, I'm really, have, really enjoying that. I have a um, pressure, a regular pressure cooker. We have two crock pots at our house. In, in the kosher style, one is for meat, one is for dairy. Right. We use the... Actually, there's an interesting thing. Speaking of Crock-Pot's recipe, I want to try. There's a um, guy who does Revolutionary War, 19th century reenactment called Jay Townsend. He has a YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. And it's been called, it's, you know, it's a recipe from the 19th century called uh, Pocket Soup. And it's basically dehydrated beef broth um, that they made back then. And he shows how to make it in a slow cooker. And one of these days I'm going to get around to making that. And um, I do a lot of fancy ramens for lunch where I'll take, you know, the noodles from ramen and add mm-hmm. real soup mix and miso paste and vegetables and lots of stuff like that. So that would be a good base for that. Yeah, that sounds really great. I know that some of the folks who do keto also wind up doing uh, intermittent fasting, which is something that I'm interested in. And uh, for that, they, they usually do like uh, a, a bone broth or something like that. So I, I, I've heard of it. I've not had the courage yet to try it. I have been doing push-ups. I'm up to, um, I did 45 push-ups today and this was just like normally I've been doing, I've been just, I just upped it from 20. Um, and, and that's, um, I had biceps for the first time in my life. It's really weird. <laughs> I mean, no one's going to, you know, confuse me with a weightlifter, but they're there. It's really cool. Nice. Yeah. The, the rip, I, I don't eat pork, but we do beef ribs every so often, and they're yummy. Yeah, that sounds really good too. They, I've seen uh, the beef ribs at the store, so it's something that. Yeah, I the um, we live in a rented apartment, so a smoker is probably not the best thing for us right now. Yeah, we do have a porch, I guess, but 
you know, maybe in a couple of years. Yeah, that's where mine lives on, on the porch. But anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this uh, episode up. If people want to find you to do a chat bot or something, where, where do they um, find you? Best place is through either is through LinkedIn. That's where I tend to be active with this stuff. Okay. Uh, I have a Twitter account, but I try to ignore Twitter because I find it's not very useful. So um, LinkedIn is the best place. I'll send, and I'll send, Chuck, I'll send you the LinkedIn page so you can. I think we're connected on LinkedIn anyway. Yeah, we but, are. So, yeah, we can definitely link, put that in. LinkedIn is the best place. I also have a YouTube channel about Elm called Pain Free Web Development. There's a lot of stuff with that. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. Thanks for coming, Zach. Uh, thanks for having me, Chuck. And it was great seeing you again. Yeah, you too. All right. We'll catch everybody next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more. 